I suspect he will at least try early on to see how his defense performs with mostly a four-man rush. He may throw a blitz here and there, but I don't see him coming out gangbusters, throwing the kitchen sink of stuff at Jimmy Garoppolo and then trying to leave his corners, you know, on an island against Debo and, and uh, not just Brandon Ayuk, but they have another player now who, uh, Sherfield, Trent Sherfield, who's kind of, um, ex- you know, elevated his role there. Hey, Eagles fans, if you're a subscriber to the Jacob Media YouTube channel, you are already registered to win a pair of season tickets for the upcoming season. That's right. You could win a pair of season tickets for the upcoming 2021 season just for being a subscriber. If you're watching and you're not a subscriber, do it now. Subscribe to the Jacob Media YouTube channel right now. What do you need to do? Subscribe right now. Tuning in to Birds 365 here on a Thursday morning. You got your Mac and Mac guys, McMullen and McDonald. We're joined by Jeff Mosher, who looks very contemplative. He's getting ready for his uh, InsideTheBirds.com duties this weekend. Mosher, what are you so seriously thinking about? How I can get to the shore like you guys with that beautiful. <laughs> 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 Yeah, it's tough. That the weather's still nice, so you're still going to get traffic, Jeff. I know, so just, I know, I can deal yeah. with it though. I, yeah. I need a few more beach weekends before this weather turns. I hear that? <laughs> uh, let, all right, let's start. the theme of the show before you, had, you you drop by, Jeff, and obviously read Jeff's work at InsideTheBirds.com. Listen to him and Adam Kaplan, also friend of the sh- uh, show, Inside the Birds podcast, sustainable. That's what we've been saying. Sustainable is what the Eagles did offensively with the quarterback. Let's face it. They schemed Jalen Hurts up. They did a wonderful job. Is it sustainable long term? I think that remains to be seen. I think that you can have a good functional offense and you can dictate tempo if you have the right offensive line, if you have the right play caller and you have the right personnel, the right quarterback, you know, the Eagles are going to play the 49ers on Sunday, and that's a team that's known as being overly schematic from, from top to bottom with everything they do because they have a coach who does that from, from day one and brings in the personnel to fit the scheme. And you see, even when they have injuries like they did last year, they lose Garoppolo, Nick Mullins goes in. Did they have a great year? No. But did they completely bottom out? Did they not score points? No, they still had, had games where they were, were formidable, and that's because – They've got the other parts, right, to make it work. So the Eagles have a very good offensive line. Quarterbacks making good strides, look really good uh, against Atlanta. The receivers that they have are always going to be, you know, for the least this year, raw and learning. But he's doing a good job of putting them in places to succeed by getting them the ball quickly and in space, which is the function of Nick Sirianni's offense, what we know of it so far. And it's not going to be 32 points every week, I don't think, because obviously the more film – that develops on these players, then the more game planning against specific players they'll be. And then the Eagles challenge will be to respond to that. But from a personnel standpoint, I think they have a, they certainly have enough personnel to be better than they've been the last year, year and a half, I would say. Everybody's attitude coming out of game number one was, wow, better than I thought, which is a good attitude to have. Glad to have it. Not Falcons fans. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, they, they surely did not. The, the, the sad thing about the Falcons is they probably didn't think that it was that much worse than they thought. Oh, it is. Um, which were you more surprised by? The dominance by the Eagle offense or the dominance by the Eagle defense for the last three quarters? We understand that the Falcons moved the ball a lot, settled for two field goals in the first quarter, but the last three quarters were just stone cold dominant on defense. Which surprised you more, Jeff? Yeah, probably the defense, Jody. I thought offensively with their healthy offensive line and facing an Atlanta team that has really one guy that you got to block, Grady Jarrett. That's it. You got one guy that you got to really worry about disrupting what you want to do offensively. And they blocked him up fairly well. So it doesn't surprise me that they move the ball fairly well. Uh, I was surprised on defense. You know, you're never surprised when this team gets a good pass rush, but um, it looked at times where Matt Ryan just had 
zero opportunity, uh, you know, to throw the ball, especially after the first drive. And then it looked at times like he had to hold on to the ball because maybe he wasn't exactly sure what was going on on the back end with the Eagles playing a lot more zone than they've played in the past. So I don't know how much they expected that much zone. So it was obviously very difficult. Once they couldn't run the ball, guys, their offense was completely dormant because that was really the only weapon that they had in an arsenal to use against the Eagles. Now, it's interesting because the running game, we all know you talked about Kyle Shanahan, his scheme, his running scheme is the best in the NFL. Everybody raves about it. Everybody talks about it. Everybody tries to copy it and a few with success. Um, I look at that Eagles route, week one route, Jeff. The one thing you could take out of it and say, "Eh, just place a little asterisk here is stopping the run, especially when you get the teams who can run the football. Well, here we are. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe Raheem Mostert's hurt. Um, you know, they have a six-round pick. That for whatever reason, Kyle Shanahan doesn't think Trey Sermon is ready. But, you know, George Kittle's caving in the side of the <laughs> defensive line. Trent Williams is still the best left tackle in football. You have this zone scheme that goes back to Mike Shanahan and Alex Gibbs. And then you have Eric Wilson trying to stop the run on the Eagles side of the football. Is that a concern? It's definitely a concern. Um, you know, Jonathan Cannon was asked, and you you know this, John, about, you know, any changes that he made uh, as far as stopping the run after that bad first quarter, first and a half uh, against the Falcons. And he said that the guys played their keys better. They did, they, you know, they, they got the nerves out. And I'm not quite sure – he was being revealing everything because, you know, obviously, you know, the all 22 is not out and the NFL.com is really falling asleep there. Um, but I did rewatch the game. And what I didn't notice in real time was that late second quarter, they had a package, right. That was meant to stop the run. When, when the Falcons were going to come out with two full, uh, two tight ends and a fullback and go really big and run the Eagles had a package of Eric Wilson and TJ Edwards. Cause Edwards is their better run stopping linebacker. Well, after Eric Wilson whiffed on about three or four tackles, later in the game it became Sean Bradley and TJ Edwards in those specific situations. And Sean Bradley is a good tackler. You know, he's a smart player. He's an overachiever for being, uh, I think, a sixth or a seventh-round pick. But if your plan against the 49ers is, okay, we're stopped, you know, we have to take Eric Wilson, our quote-unquote best linebacker, off the field to put in Sean Bradley for better run defense, Kyle Shannon's going to come out with the same exact formation – try to get that same defense on the field. And unlike Atlanta, which was going to run the ball no matter what, because that's what they have to do, Kyle Shanahan and Jimmy Garoppolo are going to say, oh, Sean Bradley's on the field, T.J. Edwards on the field. This run is about to become a play action. Now those guys are going to have to figure out a way to stop George Kittle, Kyle Yushik, my fullback, who's a good pass catcher, and anybody else I'm going to throw across the middle. Now the cat and mouse game favors me because I can pass the ball. Atlanta just wasn't going to do that. That's everything that San Francisco does. And if you remember last year, second play of the game, the 49ers came out in a very big package like that, play action to usage. Um, someone was hurt. So I believe the the linebackers were Edwards again and, and Nate Gary, and usage was wide open down the left sideline, 20 yards, and he wound up dropping the ball or Nick Mullins either underthrew him. I couldn't remember, but Jimmy Garoppolo won't un- underthrow him on that. Yeah, let me ask you about Garoppolo, because John and I talked about him in hour number one. Certainly when you trade up in the first round to get into a position to take a quarterback like they did with Trey Lance, Trey Lance is going to be the future quarterback of the 49ers. He's not going to be the quarterback of the 49ers this week. He may get in like he did last week, just to throw a wrinkle at the Eagles and make them think about it and uh, be prepared and stay on top of it. But Jimmy Garoppolo is going to win or lose the game for the 49ers this week. Is Garoppolo good enough to beat the Eagles? Yeah, he's good enough to beat the Eagles. He's not great by any means, but the Eagles don't have a great defense. Now, what he's not good enough to do, Jody, is win the game – heroically, if the Eagles' pass rush is as good as it was against the Atlanta Falcons. Now, in order to have a pass rush that good, you've got to force the opponents behind the sticks pretty often. You have to see a lot of third and longs like the Falcons did or second and longs like the Falcons did. And honestly, a lot of those wounds for the Falcons were self-inflicted. I mean, there were a couple of drives in the second quarter where they had three penalties on five or six snaps. So it kind of made it easy for the Eagles to get into tee-off 
mode with their defensive linemen. So that if if they're struggling to run the ball, the 49ers, and they're behind the sticks, no, that that's that sets up well for the Eagles. You know, if they're playing when they're playing Patrick Mahomes in a couple of weeks, you're going to say it may not matter if he's behind the sticks. You're going to have to still be on your keys and third down. You're going to have to really go after him and get him. Uh, and you may have to get him twice. But with Garoppolo, he's just not at he's not near that level. You can get to him if he's uh, if he doesn't have time to throw the ball. You know, speaking of the pass rush, Jeff, you know, everybody for years in this town wants blitz, 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 blitz. Why don't you blitz? Why don't you blitz, Jim Swartz? You show up, you, you give up six points, 260 yards. Oh, by the way, you play a bunch of zone and blitz 10% of the time. No <laughs> blitzing whatsoever because you don't have to blitz. You right. don't have to blitz. And it's crazy to blitz if you don't have to blitz. The problem this week is now Trent Williams is in front of you and that 49ers offensive line. It's going to be much more difficult to get uh, pressure with four. Um, Are we going to see some of the the A-gap stuff this week? Are we going to see some of the overload stuff? Um, You got to to continue to develop. Is is JG going to – is is he going to do that? Is he capable of doing that in your mind? It's a great question. I think he's capable of doing it. I don't think he wants to, I, especially coming off a win like last week. So, I, I'm, you know, this is just us kind of spitballing here. I suspect he will at least try early on to see how his defense performs with mostly a four-man rush. He may throw a blitz here and there, but I don't see him coming out gangbusters, throwing the kitchen sink of stuff at Jimmy Garoppolo and then trying to leave – his corners, you know, on an island against Debo and and uh, not just Brandon Ayuk, but they have another player now who, uh, Sherfield, Trent Sherfield, who's kind of, um, ex- you know, elevated his role there. Uh, it, it just depends on the type of confidence he's going to have in Steven Nelson, really, because I think he still has confidence in, in Slay. But Nelson is a guy who is tough, scrappy, um, tackles well, normally physical, but he's he's not a burner and he's been burned by burners. So you're going to want to limit how many times that guy is matched up one-on-one. I got another uh, defense question for you, Jeff. John and I talked about it uh, Monday and each of the last three days, as a matter of fact. Um, It seemed to me like Avante Maddox drew a lot of coverage on uh, the tight end of the Falcons, Mr. Pitts, on Sunday because they weren't in three wide receiver sets often but yet he was still on the field, so got to cover somebody. And he ended up getting the pits assignment, even though he's the shortest of the Eagle cornerbacks. He's drawing the six foot six tight end. And I thought he did a pretty good job. People were wondering, was Pitts just not ready to rock week one as a rookie, or was he well covered playing and play out when they did the uh, and, and Maddox missed a couple of tackles both on Pitts and uh, in run help coverage. Uh, I, I didn't think he tackled well, but I thought he covered great. A little different assignment this week against George Kittle. A little bit further along in his career, a little bit more of a difficult cover. Is Maddox going to draw that assignment as often as he did one-on-one against the tight end as he did week one? So, so it's my understanding that the team played a, at least 75% of zone against Atlanta. And, you know, obviously you saw they rushed four and they dropped seven, which is – why it was so difficult for Matt Ryan to be able to pass because he just didn't have it. You can get open in zone. You just need your quarterback to have a little bit of time to, to either find you in the flats or for your receivers to kind of sit down in that cushion. And of course, Matt Ryan had no time. So I suspect that what we, what we all saw was when they threw to Kyle Pitts, Avante Maddox looks like he's there because he's covering him, but that is mostly the, the area where he was assigned to. And I think that with this defense right now, that's the best way to go about it is to have them playing as much zone as possible. They, they just don't have great coverage linebackers. They don't have – they have one good cover corner. They don't have great coverage safety. So for them to be able to, you know, rush four, maybe five, as John is alluding to, you're probably going to have to force the issue at some point. But to be able to drop at least six, seven, uh, and sometimes eight if you're going to, you know, only send a three-man rush just to, for a little confusion – that makes it difficult, right, for those guys, for those tight ends to really find those seams and areas uh, to sit down and make those catches if the quarterback is under pressure and duress. If not, it's going to be a long day for the Eagles' defense. But that, what I like about the function of this zone is that you're not asking guy Like, look, you know, last year Avante Maddox was asked to go match up one-on-one on the outside with guys who were taller than him, faster than him, and better than him. 
it's just, the number one job of a coach is to put a player in position to succeed. And right from the start of the season, Avante Maddox was not in a position to succeed. And that had a trickle up or down effect on the entire secondary. So now, now these guys are basically told, this is your area. These are your lengths. These are your drops. This is, and as long as your spatial awareness and your peripheral vision is where it's supposed to be, as long as you're disciplined, the job will get done. They're not asking guys yet to go have to do things that they are physically incapable of doing. Jeff, let's take it to the offensive side of the ball because I think it's so interesting. Jordan Mailata gets the big extension before the opener. Uh, Didn't happen week one, obviously. Week two, here it is. Arguably Mm -hmm. the best edge rusher in football when he's healthy. I think he was the key to the 49ers more than anybody else going to the Super Bowl. He was that dominant. He can wreck a game. I don't know if he's 100% of what he was, but Nick Bose is about as good as it gets. Is, is that where Nick Sirianni has to start? Is he the guy you got to block, make sure first, if you want to get anything done offensively? Yeah, I think you're 100% right. You know, they have some other good defensive linemen. Javon Kinlaw is pretty good, but I think he's banged up as well. Uh, Eric Armstead's a good player, um, but the, the guy is Bosa. You know, I go back and forth. I, I honestly don't know who's better, him or his brother. They're both really, really good. You look at them statistically and how many pressures and sacks they've had in, in the relatively sh- <laughs> few amount of games that they've played in their career, and it's it's kind of crazy. And uh, even crazier, I guess, the Eagles are going to play against both of them. So Mylott will have a, a chance to study one before he goes to the other later this season. But, um, yeah, that that's the matchup to me. That John, that's the key matchup because we've seen a lot of games, both Eagles games, NFL games, that get wrecked by one bad matchup. I mean, this goes back to, we can talk about Winston Justice and OCU Manura. We can go back to um, last year, whether it was, you know, Jack Driscoll starting at right tackle or Jason Peters at times with uh, those two Cowboys guys. Uh, he, he really struggled and it wrecks an entire game, a whole game plan. So it's, I, I imagine that when you pay Jordan Mile out of that money, you don't want to have to then go and put a tight end right next to him to help him out, right? You want to have five outlets yeah. every pass play that, that you got. And that's why he's getting paid the big money. And this will be a, we know that the money doesn't make you any better. Right. So, but this is a test where a game where he comes under the microscope and you're going to find out about how fastly, how fast and how rapidly he's really improving. You know, Falcon fans may say that uh, that Hargrave guy kind of wrecked the game on us last week. You don't usually get it from a defensive tackle unless their name is Aaron Donald, but that's exactly the way it went last week. Um, you kind of talked about I'm going to try and tie you down a little bit more. How often do you think they keep the back in to give my lot of theoretically a little extra help because the Bosa assignment is as tough as it is? How often do the Eagles keep the, the running back in? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It'll be if it in that situation, usually you keep it back in for the extra rusher. In this situation, the question would be, do they keep a, uh, do they have the back chipping him on the way out, which is something they did a lot in training camp, but that's kind of, also what you see a lot of in training camp, and then it tends to disappear during the season. So I imagine they'll have some kind of plan to get a body on him. It, you know, they may let Mylotta be on Mylotta Island for a little while and see how that goes. And you would like, la- I always say this, you would like to think if it's not working, then they'll figure out a way to either chip or get an extra body on him. But I still remember that game that OC had against Winston and wondering why is Andy Reid not <laughs> doing anything about this? So yeah. coaches can get pretty stubborn. There were some times where Doug did the same thing, and I wonder – why don't you just help out a little more? There? But, uh, the, you know, we'll see if Nick Sirianni is, uh, you know, the stubborn goat that most head coaches are, or if he's got a better plan. Um, the backs, uh, the the back seven, really, re- really the secondary, because the front seven is the strength of the 49ers uh, defense. You mentioned the defensive line. Fred Warner is one of the best linebackers in football. Mm-hmm. Um, corners, though. They lose uh, uh, Verrett, who's their best corner probably. Uh, so two pretty significant injuries in week one uh, for the 49ers as a whole. Do the Eagles receivers, we saw, I mean, there's talent. Uh, we saw Devontae Smith. I'm most impressed with the football IQ. He's calling out cornerback blitzes at times. Um, he's just so uh, ahead of the curve when it comes to route running. Are they at the point? And, it, and it's more outside Devontae. So it's more, I guess, a Jalen Rager, Quez Watkins question. Can they take advantage of a team that 
is struggling at the corner position with injuries. Are they at that point yet? Or and and by the way, on the back end of that, is Jalen Hurts' air yard is going to be up, or is it going to be bubble screen, bubble screen, quick, quick, get the football out of his hand? Right, John. It, the, the big question is: Was last week's game plan specifically catered to get their ball the ball in the hands quickly like that against that Dean Pease defense that tries to disguise and deceive and you're trying to make life a little easier on your quarterback? Or was it because this coaching staff still is not comfortable yet with having the ball thrown deep to receivers who have not exactly proven to be deep threats yet? You know, last year they tried that with John Hightower and it was like 50-50 whether he was going to catch the ball or not. And then when you have a wide open pass and a guy doesn't catch it, there's nothing that infuriates a coach even more. That's a blown opportunity. Now, Jalen Rager had some opportunities last year in the season opener, caught a couple of deep ones, also had some route running um, explosion issues that they want to work on. I'd like to see them try to drive the ball with Jalen Rager. Uh, same thing with Quez Watkins. You know, he, he showed you that he has dynamic ability. And you go back to the preseason game where he beat the Steelers corner. I think it was Mike Hilton one-on-one, -on -one, and then the pass just didn't connect. But for all that speed, it's interesting how they seem to want to use him on the short stuff. And I know that with him, he's kind of a daily – uh, work in progress with the coaches to to get him laser focused on all his responsibilities, lining up correctly. So some of this might be a trust issue about, you know, do, against this 49ers defense, am I going to really have a couple of guys running deep and not sure if they're going to run the right route or be able to bring the ball in, but eventually you got to throw these, you have to see. So I would like to think they're going to try to stress these cornerbacks of the 49ers a little bit more, um, especially if, if Jalen Hurts has time. Uh, but we'll learn a lot, I, I would think, about what the coaches think about their wide receiver as, as a whole after this game. All right, Jeff Mosher, time for my favorite question, a hypothetical. Uh, 49ers, George, George <laughs> Kittle catches a pass in the back of the end zone. Extra point is good. 49ers go up 13-10 with a minute and 46 seconds to go in the first half kickoff out of the end zone they got the ball on the 20 146 to go two tight end two timeouts left uh go down the field and get a field goal tie it up at half or a touchdown retake the lead who's in the backfield with 146 to go in the first half with two timeouts left is it game well like he was last week miles sanders or shuttling them both in and out wow that's a great question <laughs> i mean that, well, that's why they pay me the big bucks for this show, Jeff. I know. Uh, and if they <laughs> actually have that exact scenario, I want you to have me on next week so we can say, hey, Jody, yes, you Yes, are we brilliant. will. You will be back on this time next week if it's the exact situation that I just laid out. <laughs> oh, man. So where's the ball starting at again? <laughs> 25. He kicks it out of the end zone. Look, I, th I think to answer your question, these guys have very similar skill sets. They're not exactly alike, but they can do – the same things as far as you know running to the edges uh, i think i think right now miles sanders is still better between the tackles runner um I, I was a little impressed by gainwell's ability to pass protect a little bit last week so we'll see if he keeps making strides there i don't want to call him interchangeable yet I, I feel like i feel like my um miles is the primary back and if you look at the indianapolis colts where nick came from i, I feel like gainwell is their naheem hines version of this, which which to answer your question means that either of those guys could be in there, and there's really no reason why both might not be in there in an empty formation backfield, and both are in the slot, you know, right and left, because we saw that as well, and they're both good pass catchers, and they can stress a defense in the passing game, and they've talked a lot about their their 21 speed uh, personnel and and just two two running backs out there to create you know mismatches in the passing game. Uh, final one from me, Jeff, because I want to get your thought process. We talked about, we started this, um, the 49ers are eventually going to get to Trey Lance. Uh, there's no question about that. It's just a matter of when it's not going to be this week, but he's going to be on the field. Um, how much is he going to be on the field? Is, is it going to ramp up? Are we still talking about just a play here and there? Uh, mm -hmm. or is he going to start this early to try to get this potential on the field? I compare it a lot to Alex Smith and Colin Kaepernick back in the day where Alex won a lot of games, but Jim Harbaugh knew there was a ceiling there. 
in, in that case, it was injury, and right. he just turned the page. How right. quickly is this team going to get to Trey Lance? Probably quicker than than people expect. I mean, first of all, Jimmy's had trouble staying healthy, so Trey Lance well, yeah. had one injury away from being the quarterback. I, you know, he played. He threw a touchdown pass uh, pretty early in that game last week, right against the Lions. And I don't know how many. Oh, that's probably the only snap he might have played. So uh, I think that's intentional. Didn't want to showcase him too much. I would be shocked if he didn't play at least four to five more snaps uh, in this game, especially uh, in zone read or or RPO type capacity. Seeing how the Eagles really struggled against the run last week. Now you've got a running quarterback with good running game. That's that makes the defense even more nervous and on its toes. So it wouldn't surprise me if you saw him more often and even earlier against the Eagles. Most from time to time, John and I have uh, gotten on the coach's case, kiddingly so, about the uh, pandering ability that he has <laughs> going on the Phillies jersey and the like. Hey, coach is pretty good. He may have looked real wet behind the ears in that first press conference he had, but he's caught up real fast. Yeah, specifically it was all part of the rope-a-dope yeah. routine, right? <laughs> and he's sucking up to the fans uh, aspect of his job, and we give him the nod for it. So I'm going to do some pandering of my own right here. How much does the frenzied Eagle crowd in the link on Sunday help this team out? It's pretty good. I mean, I don't know if it's going to be as good as my whiteout crowd at Penn State against Auburn on Saturday, Ooh, oh, yeah. which is going to be really tough Speaking on Speaking of sucking up, let's just suck up the Penn State. <laughs> good job, like Mosher. <laughs> <laughs> Mosher's is- trying to keep James Franklin from USC. That's what's Oh, going absolutely. On and I don't even <laughs> love the guy, I, but I never want him to leave. He's the, the best recruiter we've ever had, and if he's, he's going to blow games, but we're going to still win 10 just on talent alone. So I'm, I'm good with that. Um, but no, I, I think it's, it's, you know, the San, look, we know the San Francisco crowd, the whole West coast crowd is a lot different than the East coast crowd, but I, I, it's also not something the 49ers or any other team that comes into the link is unfamiliar with, but the noise can bother them. You get to certain parts of the, uh, the red zone or the end zone. And obviously the noise gets ratcheted up and you're working on a silent count. Now the thing with the, the 49ers is. I don't think they have too many new personnel on the offensive line. Is that right, John? I, I think that they're yeah, uh, Alex line. Mack is, is, but he's a veteran. Yeah, um, he's a veteran. So. so I would worry about it more if it was, uh, you know, like kind of the Eagles offensive line last year, where you got like three new guys and you're, 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 they're all young and you're moving them all around. But I don't suspect that that'll be too much of an issue for the 49ers. Most good luck to your uh, Nits on Saturday against Auburn. That should be the game of the week, as a matter of fact. And then we got a good one right here on Sunday between the 49ers and the Eagles. We'll be reading your coverage, catching the podcast after the fact. Thank you much for hopping on with us today on Birds 365. You got it, guys. Have a good one. Jeff Thanks, Mosher Jeff. from InsideTheBirds.com, Inside the Birds podcast, here with us on Birds 365. All right, McDonald and McMullen coming back. We need to put a bow on the show. Final 10 minutes coming your way here in Burn.